welfare of humanity by drawing on the wisdom of the Masters as transmitted to us by HBB, Alcott and Judge and others. That says everything, doesn't it? So you can go home in your water taxis. And it says absolutely nothing. So you can come back on your vaporettos. <laughs> Seriously, um, I remember Rather Bernier talking in Narden many, many years ago, 20 years ago, that the root cause of all our problems is selfishness. And I say to myself, why did she go on and on? Can't hear you. Can't hear you. I said to myself, why does she go on and on about selfishness? And after some nearly 35 years or more in the Thisopka society, I think I can answer that question. That really seems to be the cause of all our problems. Selfishness can exist on many levels. The physical level, of course, we could be very unselfish, and I can take all of you to the pub and buy you champagne and drinks, but I can be very unselfish at the physical level, but very selfish intellectually. I may not accept a thing that you say other than my own opinion, my opinion, my teacher, my guru. So all of these words have to be taken at various levels. Can you hear me, Harold? If you can't, just put the microphone on. Just no, uh, hold the microphone. Come sit here. Hold the microphone. No, I don't intend holding the microphone for two hours no. because I'm manipulating the projector. Otherwise, you know. So why did I put it there? All right? Is your Right, so the context of our exposition. Well, one has to move around a little. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 The ring pass knot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. So the contents of our exposition. Essential principles of philosophical work. In two parts. First, we have to deal with the theoretical precepts and foundation. You've had your overture. I'm going to talk about the divine plan and purpose of our society. It's too small from the back. You need to expand it. I have handouts, by the way, oh. so uh, we can proceed. I do have all the handouts, so let's, let's carry on. The focus and primary function of the society, the core theosophy, what is this universal law and how do we actuate it? And then our three objectives, the science of brotherhood, what wastes our energies, and blocks and dilutes our progress. In part B, you know, it's very easy to talk theory. Theory sounds very sweet. But I put it to you that if we have these lofty doctrines and wonderful precepts and glorious principles, I put it to you that there is a mode of behaviour that goes with it. Can anyone deny that? There is an organisation and a mode of behaviour that must go with it. So to implement our glorious doctrines, we have to talk about, can brotherhood be legislated? I'll go into that. What is the place of rules? Do dogs wag their tails or do the tails wag the dogs? <laughs> Yeah. As Harold said, you know, we're here to study, but we're also here to enjoy ourselves. And I, I like what you said. We have to study, we have to enjoy ourselves. So we're going to talk about wagging tails. The efficient use of energy, 
indispensable qualifications for a worker, networking, the mountain range of theosophy, and the warning, which is the sword of Damocles that hangs over us. And then I ask, are we eagles or are we parrots? <laughs> Alright? So, let's now deal with part one. The wider picture. The theoretical precepts and foundation. Starting with the divine plan and purpose. So there is a plan and purpose behind the whole seemingly chaotic cosmos. There is even a plan and purpose at London Heathrow Airport, would you believe, despite all the chaos. So everything from a grain of sand to a cosmos operates under law at its level. Science on its own has a method, but it does not try to understand the purpose or aspire towards this divine law. Science on its own. Philosophy re uh, recognizes the great plan, but it doesn't have a methodology to aspire to it. Philosophy, dry philosophy on its own. Religion certainly aspires to the plan, but it lacks the methodology. It is only theosophy, which is the coming together, the seamless fusion of science and religion and philosophy that asserts from direct knowledge and experience that there is this plan and purpose behind the universes. Direct knowledge. What we call evolution. Now just as a building cannot materialize without the services of the architect, the mason, the builder, the humble plumber, the carpenter, so the divine plan needs an army of agents to actuate it, to build it, to express it. And this um, divine plan, this architectural plan, is under the um, custodianship of the great agents. The great uh, one such plan operating on earth is the great white brotherhood, the elder brethren. Those who have attained liberation but still stay in touch with humanity to help evolution on this earth, even though they have fulfilled their part in the great plan. And as I say, one such brotherhood functioning on earth is the Great White Brotherhood. And the Theosophical Society is one of the movements launched by this Great Brotherhood on earth with the purpose of helping humanity in its further evolution. So what is our focus? Our focus here and it's important to be aware of it. It is to make possible for humanity to take the next step forward in evolution by showing to men, by example, that such a thing as theosophy exists and will continue to exist. There is no question of imposing beliefs on humanity or on our friends and fellow beings. It is a question of showing by example, not preaching or proselytizing. Can you hear me now? No, Good. No. Excellent. So we are getting there. We are evolving, aren't we? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so the focus, the plan to show that such a, theos as a theosophy exists, the divine law, the focus through the Theosophical Society is best expressed in this way. The wider picture, the purpose to bequeath to humanity deeper truths, to instill into our thought atmosphere such fundamental concepts as karma, brotherhood, evolution, in order to usher in a better world, and to provide agents in the outer world who can actually understand the plan and consciously qualify themselves to cooperate in the great work of the elder brotherhood. The focus of Theosophical Wisdom and its transmission through the Theosophical Society is primarily to heal 
souls and deal with the causes of sorrow and only secondarily to deal with consequences by a study of eternal verities, contemplating their meaning and applying the teachings for personal development and for service. And the best example I can give you of this fundamental purpose is this letter from Mahatma Maurya to Frau Mary Geha. Now she was a, a Red Cross nurse and she wrote, got transmitted, her letter to the Master asking, should I join the Red Cross? And the Mahatma says this, and it's such a beautiful reply, it really encapsulates our whole raison d'etre, our whole purpose. He says, you have offered yourself for the Red Cross, but sister, there are sicknesses of the soul that no surgeon's art can possibly heal. Shall you therefore tell humanity that all you're going to do is heal yourself? So our primary task is to help heal at the soul, S-O-U-L level, whilst of course not neglecting the physical consequences and all the squalor in the world. But the emphasis is placed very much on the causes of sorrow and only secondarily on the consequences. Because you can deal with a million consequences, you don't find the cause, it happens again and again. Is that fair enough? You find the one cause, you've dealt with the whole problem. <clears throat> so the founding of the Theosophical Society is part of a definite move to lift the corner of the veil, to reveal to humanity some of life's deeper mysteries. And we are, we, the society, are now trying to understand these truths firstly, then struggling to put them into practice. The deeper the truth, the more acute the struggle. Bear that in mind. The deeper the truth, the more acute the struggle to put it actually into practice. So we try to understand the truth, put it into practice, and then transmit and teach it to others, to aspiring learners. So we're not just a philanthropic body like Oxfam or Red Cross, wonderful though they are, we are more than that because our conviction on this divine law is based not on gullible belief but an actual fact for those who wish to discover it for themselves. So we've dealt with purpose, we've dealt with the focus, now what's the function? Our function, following off of this, is to change contemporary thought and attitude so that humanity can evolve. <clears throat> the greater the clarity, the less we waste time and energy chasing down dead ends, and the clearer our aim, the more widely flung our diverse activities can be focused. So a tremendous responsibility lies in very few hands. It is our task not just to learn this law, but to love the law. It is our task not so much to spiritualize humanity, which sounds a bit arrogant, but to humanize, to humanize, really become human. Because how many of us are truly human, let's face it? There are plenty of people who are so sincerely devoted to helping the sick and the suffering, but their imperfect understanding of the higher laws rather stultifies and blocks their efforts. So we've dealt with the wider picture and now I'm going to move on from the wider picture onto some core precepts, some core precepts of theosophy. And I'm going to call it core precepts. And here's the first one, and I'll explain it. It's the downward cascading of light and splitting of light from a central source to many reflections at the lower level. Now, every company, every corporation is organized in this way. You have the chief executive officer. He sets the policy. 
you have the project managers who then take that policy mission and evolve the management structures. You have the workers who then develop the tools and the practices to put that one mission into practice. So the head of General Motors will say, I want to build cars. The project managers organize it, the workers build the cars. So the one vision gets split into many beams, all of which contain that one vision. In our society, we have the chief executive officers as the masters. What is their vision statement? What is their vision statement of the masters? Is it not, we want a brotherhood of humanity? Isn't that the mission? But how will we do it? Well, the chief executive never, so to speak, gets his hands dirty on the shop floor. He's done all that. He gets the project managers. He gets Blavatsky, Olcott, and Judge, and others to manage the mission there. And the Theosophical Society, us members, are putting that vision, that management, into practice. So at all levels are necessary. So you have one policy, many procedures. You have one flame, one light many sparks, us, and how is that reflected in our society? We have one motto, don't we? There is no religion higher than truth. We have brotherhood as our intent. We have the second object, comparative study. And we have the third object, the latent powers in man. The first tells us our intent. The second, how and who will manage it. And the third, what will be done? So we see this central hierarchical arrangement pervading really all of society, our society, and any system where there is law and organization. So I have a copy of that. Don't get hung up on the details. Just try and get the, the general picture. So our three objects are so important. The second one is exceptionally important. The first one we think we know. But the second one, Leibniz tells us that philosophical schools in general are not, are largely right in what they assert, but not so in what they deny. In other words, the greatest failing is the sectarian spirit where one school of thought thinks it knows best, and criticizes ignorantly another school of thought. I'm, I'm just paraphrasing it. So Leibniz is saying, quite clearly, that Leibniz is saying that our root cause is, out of the way, is the sectarian spirit, okay? And truth is best served not by accumulating facts, like adding bits and pieces to a jigsaw, but really by formulating, developing a framework that maximizes the compatibility of the various points of view. And I'm suggesting our second object is like that framework. Because if we think of our second object, we have divine, the source, the invisible white light of truth. And it's like putting it through a diverging lens. And what does a diverging lens do? It splits up the beams. 
Truth can never be given out by one person. So all the various sages of all times, Krishna, Buddha, Jesus, Blavatsky, Anzum, Krishnamurti, all of them, have really given out various streams of truth. And in our second object, we, so to speak, put a converging lens that brings these various streams of truth together, as the lens does, to produce white light again from all these various beams. So what I'm saying is, with great emphasis, is that all these various teachers are not cancelling each other out. Green, orange, blue, indigo light does not cancel out light. It's a, a part of the white light. So if we combine the various streams, which is what our second object encourages us to do, we then produce the white light. As above, so below. So our second object is this reconciling system of harmony that Leibniz mentions. And Leibniz gets such a good press in the secret doctrine, does she not? Blavatsky is so complimentary of Leibniz. So I thought I'd mention Leibniz there. But then there's some people who say, and I like this, that theosophy is just a mixture and a muddle of all the various sciences and religions, all stuffed together. And you have this individual who says this. The whole point is, we don't have to agree or disagree, we have to look, listen, think and make up our minds. All right? So is theosophy just a mixture of all the religions? Well, this chap, Osho, <laughs> says, all kinds of fools gathered under the banner of theosophy, it was a hodgepodge. It was an effort to create a synthesis out of all the religions, but no synthesis is possible. What he's saying is, suppose you have 20 women, beautiful women, you cut out the eyes of one, you cut off the nose of another, you cut off the hair of another, assemble all the parts together, and you do not have a living body, but you have a corpse, and in doing so you've killed 20 women. And only fools and stupid people can do that. Well, just hold it, <laughs> don't react. This is what theosophy has done to Hinduism, Buddhism and Taoism. It's produced this sort of beautiful corpse by cutting out the parts of beautiful women. Do empty vessels make the most noise? I suggest they do. Because that is pure rubbish. If you look further, Christmas Humphreys. And he knew what he was talking about. He produced a bridge, an abridgment of the secret doctrine. And he says he knows of no system that uh, has created with the force and clarity, as the secret doctrine does, not as a pastiche, but pointing to their origin and source. So they who have the voice of ignorance and the voice of genuine inquiry. And it is really a common criticism I hear about theosophy. It's just a mixture. Well, I say to people, what the hell do you want? Do you want proof that there is this eternal wisdom stream that flows through all the religion, science and philosophy? And if you read the summary of the secret doctrine, you can almost hear poor Blavatsky shrieking. She almost says, what can I do? You want proof, I have to assemble as evidence all the various choice um, bits and pieces. I can't put the whole of the Vedas together. I can't put everything on philosophy together. All I can do is to extract the bits for your examination to see there is this common thread. If you want proof. If you don't want proof, don't ask me to do it. But people want to have their cake and eat it, and they're so lazy they won't inquire for themselves. So theosophy is not a mixture. It only appears as a mixture when people do not realize this. As Krishnamurti so rightly said, the bee makes its honey from several flowers. And honey is not a synthesis of flowers. Honey is the essence of the flowers. So, theosophy is the honey 
of all the science, religions, and philosophy. And honey has tremendous vitality. If you eat Manuka honey, you know what I'm talking about. So therein lies the difference. The centre of gravity now of theosophy. What is the centre of gravity of theosophy? Truth is our religion, so to speak. Brotherhood and not cronyism. And by cronyism I mean we only hug and go lovey-dovey to people who vote for us on a committee and we sit at a tea party and gossip about those who don't like us. You know, that's the sort of uh, what people like to think of as brotherhood, but it's nothing to do with that. Really, brotherhood is recognising, not just accepting, but really recognising the higher principle in every person. And it is impossible to like everyone. It is impossible. But we try not to dislike anyone. And we recognise that every person is on their path and has their trials and tribulations. And whereas we may not like them, they are still imbued with their higher self. If only that higher self could make rather more contact. Universality. No political or religious affiliations. While we recognise our source. And we note that theosophy is the cornerstone, and not the capstone, as Colin will explain, the cornerstone of all religions. And the lesser is always subsumed in the greater. And a key test of a speaker's theosophical qualification is to sense this quality of universality in whatever he tries to impart. The core doctrine, which is also our central centre of gravity, the core doctrine is proven by the sages, by personal experience over centuries of experience in every department of nature. Why such emphasis on brotherhood? Brotherhood is not just a woolly phrase. There are metaphysical reasons, which we won't go into, but the one divine substance principle, which pervades all, but there are practical reasons. If we just play table tennis and ping pong balls and I throw a ping pong ball at you, it might hurt. If we play cricket and I throw a cricket ball at you, it hurts more. If we are involved in intellectual warfare, it hurts even more. Now, when we impart occult truths, if those truths are misused, then what is a blessing in the hands of the responsible becomes a curse in the hands of the irresponsible. So there is a, a very practical reason for brotherhood, because the deeper the truth, the more powerful its consequences when misused. So the physical effects are one thing, the intellectual effects another thing, the emotional effects of misuse, and the spiritual effects of misuse are far greater. That's why brotherhood is of dire necessity and not just a windy tea party phrase. So, as I say, brotherhood and harmony does not mean agreeing with one another. It, it's nothing to do with agreeing or disagreeing. And as I say, there is a real science behind brotherhood. Because as the Master has said, nature, and in fact, this is well before the age of quantum physics, nature has linked all her parts of all her empire together with subtle threads of magnetic symphony, magnetic symph sympathy as well, it could be magnetic symphony, and there is even a relationship between the meanest flower and the most distant star. And it is our law, it is the, the law of the Masters to approach every person in whom the Tathagata light has been awakened. Now, the Tathagata light is the Buddhic light, the inner light that has been switched on, the light of intuition, of course. One of the names of the Lord Buddha was Tathagata, the awakened one, the one, the one fully in, in intuition, who, who um, experience and taught by direct 
contact, intuition. So it is the law of the masters to approach and help anyone who is switched on his own inner light. And we find similar expressions in all the great religions, God helps those who help themselves. But now the expenditure of energy, there is a difference between nature enriched and nature robbed. And the master tells Hume, in this case, that you, Hume, cause a waste of cosmic energy by tongue to accumulate hardly a few ounces and the master says that a Haydn writing his symphony or Plato writing his great works causes the accumulation and the right use of cosmic energy whereas a man who deliberately goes to denounce his neighbour to the police scatters and wastes cosmic energy. Equally, the materialist and the logical positivist sorry, who tries to prove that plus times plus is minus are also wasting and scattering cosmic energy no less than a tiger which springs upon its prey and all these people who waste cosmic energy are robbing nature instead of enriching nature and to the extent that you understand what you're doing you are accountable that's obvious if you don't know what you're doing how can you be made accountable if a baby drops a mat and lights your house, you're not going to say the baby, the baby is committed arson, even though the act is the same. If I want to burn your house down and do it, I have committed arson and I'm accountable. So it's obvious that to the extent to which we understand the law and deliberately flout the law, we are to that extent made responsible for our actions. We either enrich nature or we rob nature. No, let's see what the time is. Yeah. Good. Talking of brotherhood again, there seems to be this rather peculiar mindset that any form of behaviour has got to be tolerated in the name of brotherhood. And to criticise someone for unethical or irresponsible behaviour constitutes an attack. Now, as I said earlier, there's no point in just giving a talk on theory. One has to bring in one's practical experience and one's personal observations. Not by talking about the details of the personal observations, but, but by trying to draw out a general principle from those observations. Otherwise, we just all talk theory, we talk about brotherhood, and we kiss each other goodbye, and that's fine, and, and nothing changes. So I'm suggesting that in any company, in the hardest of material corporations and multinational oil corporations, Shell, BP, and the uh, great construction companies, whether it's uh, Brown and Root or Fleur and Kellogg, and I've been in all of them, in the hardest of these organizations, if ever there is unethical behavior meted out to any member of the staff, the personnel department will come down like a ton of bricks on you and you will have to answer to yourself. And if you can't, you are out with loss of pension rights. In other words, you are expelled. And I see no reason why in the Theosophical Society where compassion is supposed to be our foremost attribute, why this should be any different if you have a raging fever, courtesy of bacterial infection, you don't say I'm going to be brotherly to the virus and let the body die. You know, isn't that so? You, you destroy, you eliminate the virus so that the greater body may survive. So if we apply that principle, I see no reason why irresponsible or callous behaviour should be tolerated in the Theosophical Society under the name of brotherhood. I would suggest it is extremely brotherly to deal firmly, given hard evidence of irresponsible behaviour, consistent, consistently over a period of time. 
And those who actively work against us, I suggest, should be removed from our society. As happens a lot, by the way, in Australia, and I've seen it, and they are a very strong and vibrant society. But there is a difference. As theosophists, as the Bible tells us, there is there is no greater attribute than the repentant sinner. So a repentant sinner is a far greater attribute than a lackadaisical pulpit preacher, because he has learned something. So I would sincerely say, to put it quite bluntly, expel those who actively work against us, but by all means welcome them back when they show willing, because then there will be a far greater attribute and asset to us. As I say, a thief who genuinely mends his ways is a far greater asset. And there is this terrible tendency to label people. One lie does not make you a liar. Unfortunately, in court, one lie and a thousand truths, you said, no good, you're a liar. I suggest that's all because we don't live in the present moment. Anyone could have run off the rails in the past. It's what they are now. And if now they are an attribute to us, who cares what they were in the past? If they are an attribute to us now, we welcome them back. If they show willing. As I say, there's nothing worse than the repentant thief. The story of the Ramayana, we are told, Valmiki, the great sage, was what we might call these days an armed burglar in modern terms. And he met a sage, and that sage said, you, you think of Mara, you know, Mara the great devil, but just keep saying Mara a hundred times, just say Mara a hundred times. Well, say Mara a hundred times and see what happens. Mara, Mara, and it turns into Rama, doesn't it? Because Mara is just the op That is the old Indian technique of Japa, repeating the holy name. And using the simple technique, he became as the Lord Rama, as enlightened. And we are told that uh, the sage Valmiki was the author of the Ramayana. So here you have an allegorical story of the sinner turned saint. And I suggest we apply this story at all levels. And we must be as theosophists, we must be prepared to be as unpopular as is necessary in the service of truth. No normal person sets out to be unpopular unless his chakras are terribly loose and they need tightening up. But if one puts personal popularity for over and above truth, for political purposes, in order to gain power, then we are not theosophists, we are committee politicians, whatever word you might like to choose. So we have to be prepared to be as unpopular as necessary in the service of truth, and that is all. And I would certainly say in England that I can think of at least three or four people who would gladly have my, my head for dinner, were it not for the fact that they are vegetarians. <laughs> I think that might have saved my head. But anyway, all men are brothers, but some are more brotherly than others. Is that our motto? I don't think so. Do we use brotherhood and the first object as a contrivance to get our way in an argument? So, do you, you see what I'm getting at? We have these wonderful principles, but if we don't try and the only injunction is try to put some of it into practice. We're just talking theory and thereby really wasting cosmic energy and a lot of hot air. So let's talk about what wastes our energies and what blocks our progress. Because if we can remove what blocks our energies, this, we don't have to worry about how to manufacture energy. We've got the energy. We just have to remove the blocks. All right? So, I'm talking now that this is really applying to all spiritual organizations, but because I maintain that
the tears has the finest grade, the finest quality of spiritual teaching, the problems so created are that much more acute. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. The greater the truth, the greater the problem to apply it and if misused. What beliefs are energies? Well, I'm not going to leg the point. On the committee, husbands and wives, birds of a similar political feather, it makes a nonsense of objectivity, and I'm trying to put our principles now into practical application. Your vote then is emotionally driven by who you like, and the subject of the vote tends to be immaterial. Then we have a shrinking number of highly dedicated volunteers. And with volunteers dedicated and stretched in all directions, you're hardly going to have efficiency. And um, a lot of amateurs, and well, I'm not trying to be insulting, I am a complete amateur in finance, so I will not touch it. I will try and pick on a financial professional. But if I, out of pressure, step into areas into which I'm completely amateurish, I'm not going to be effective for the society. Now, another one, websites and emails, gosh, yes, they are very necessary, but don't they waste a lot of energy and time? I've got no golden answer other than being highly selective and very discriminating. Websites, of course, they spread the information. You can't hide things now. But my gosh, do they cause a lot of crud and gunge in the pipework and dilute our focus and really waste a lot of time unless we are ruthlessly um, disciplined in the way we uh, use websites and emails. Don't just fire off an email and get another email and then fire off another one, you know. And then, by almost, it certainly happens, we, we don't really seem to have a central nervous system to coordinate all our diverse activities. Each person, each society sort of does its own thing, all right. But uh, I suggest that if one could somehow think of a central nervous system, and that central nervous system could be our core precepts. If those core precepts were so root uh, fundamentally rooted, then that would act as the, as the spinal cord of which all the other organs of the society can be sort of hung and suspended. Finally, the interface with part B, the, the implementation of our teaching. What impedes and blocks our energies? The black hole of fundamentalism, how to be and how not to be a fundamentalist. The problem is over-attachment to just one teacher, book, person or group at the expense of the whole. The inability to see the global rounded perspective and going absolutely gaga over one particular narrow little part of the doctrine. This, in my opinion, in my opinion is the most central feature, is the most fundamental factor that blocks our progress and causes all the antagonisms and all the schisms and all the splits and you know judge did this and Besson did that and Levitt did that and, you know and all of all of these schisms. So let's understand how this phenomenon actually occurs. There's one thing just talking about it. Let's see how it happens. So by nature we are drawn we love one person, one teaching, one book. We can't all love the same person, otherwise he or she would be overwhelmed, wouldn't she? Can you imagine 50 billion people loving one woman or man? So, according to our temperament, we are drawn to one teacher, one book, fine. So love, strongly drawn to an idea. Then what happens? We like to say that this is my teaching. So the ego provides a bit of support, doesn't it? It shields off the love of your life from the whole. But that's all right. It's only a little bit of support. So 
You need to support the love of your life. If I love a Beethoven sonata, I have got to support it. I have got to cut it away from everything else in order to learn it. Yeah? I have to shield it. I have to mother it. Fine. Then what happens? I'm so intensely devoted to the love of my life that that ego support extends and the window of fresh air starts to close. And then I become a purist. And a purist is just about all right because there's still a bit of a window, a bit of fresh air. But then slowly the ego closes right around the love of my life and then I say, my love, my guru is the one and only allowable, all others are second rate. So first the ego has become, it was a, a warm support, now the ego has become a prison. So if we think of the black hole that someone mentioned, just as no light can escape from a black hole, because of the intensity of the gravitational Attraction is so great, no light gets out. Yeah? Similarly, no fresh idea can ever f penetrate a fundamentalist's mind because of the intensity of his mental prejudice. His mental prejudice is so intense, it locks off the space around him. And we were talking of space and time, the, 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 the clue to understanding space is mind. You know, as the great sage uh, said, we need to mentalize space and to spatialize time. So when our prejudice is so intense, it really closes off the space around us, and not even an Einstein or a Newton or a Blavatsky can penetrate that space because we have created a black hole. So, firstly, when we love someone, initially, in that first flush of love, our attitude is virtually egoless. Then the danger is our attitude is egoful. And what we are loving becomes almost of secondary importance to the fact that it's our possession and we claim it. And this may all sound uh, rather obvious to you, but... Um, to go mad over someone when you're drunk at a party uh, it might be a bit foolish, but to go mad over any one book at the expense of the whole is doubly foolish. But seriously, we find this. You may be, I may be, you may be in love with Cleopatra or Mark Antony. That doesn't mean automatically Cleopatra's books are better than someone else's. It just means that it's Good for you. Now I'd like us to really think over tea. When we are so drawn to any teacher, Krishnamurti, Blavatsky, it doesn't matter. Is it because we were introduced to that person by someone we loved? So is our love for, say, say Krishnamurti, really a second-hand way of saying I love the person who introduced him to me? I would seriously like us to think about this. Are we really loving Blavatsky? Or do we love he or she who introduced Blavatsky to us? Do I really love Beethoven? Or do I love someone who introduced me? Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. But, but get your story straight. So when people uh, get into an argument about oh, Besson's greater than Krishnamurti, what they're really telling us, me, is that the person they love is better than the person you love. With Besson and Krishnamurti, sometimes there's a bit of the excuse. Truth can be sometimes very painful, and I suggest we enjoy the pain. Truth is never painless. I'm not saying we deliberately hurt ourselves, I'm not saying we should be masochists or sadists. But if truth isn't painful, question whether truth has made a mark. And then what happens when the love of your life doesn't agree with the love of his life, all the gossip and all the schisms? 
But if you take that right back to source, where does that come from? And the worst thing we can do is to produce a cult of any teacher. The Theosophical Society, as I see it, is not a Blavatsky Society, it's not a Besson Society. It is a society that investigates truth through Blavatsky, Besson and others. Those who are so keen on putting Blavatsky on the world map will never do that. If you want to put Blavatsky on the world map, put truth on the world map. And Blavatsky will follow, logically, must do. It's, it's a bit like trying to find happiness in your life. If you want to find happiness in your life and chase it, you'll be unhappy. If you want to find happiness, make someone else happy and happiness will be your lot. It, it's a bit like that. So if you want to put the love of your life on the world philosophical map, put truth on the world map first. So as I say, the worst thing we do is produce a sectarian attitude. To ignore the complete freedom of thought and speech that lies at the heart of the society, as enshrined in the General Council Resolution, and we also then thereby ignore a heavy warning by Leibniz and HBB herself about these sectarian attitudes that will eat up the body of this society like a cancer. Janine Miller put it very, very beautifully that, and this is my thing by the way, some biting truths with a sweet sting. So every attempt, this is Blavatsky, in the key has ended in failure because it is degenerated every time by other philosophical schools has ended in failure because it has degenerated into a sect with sectarian attitudes and Janine Miller says this note of devotion to truth not any personalities or set of doctrines sounded by Blavatsky and taken up by our leaders is all too often ignored. And she, William Kingsman, who wrote that lovely book, HPV, says she taught Theosophy not as a mere doctrine, but as a living power in our lives. A living power in our lives. And I'm saying, this is me, that neither Blavatsky nor the Masters ever instructed us to clone ourselves like in genetic engineering, to clone ourselves on the secret doctrine, or grow stem cells out of the doctrine. And rather, Dr. Bernier says that the Theosophical Society can only continue to be a force for good to the extent that Theosophy does not become just another set of doctrines. I belong to the Chopin Society. We love Chopin. But all of the people who perform for us, we don't perform Beethoven, they perform Bach, we don't criticize Debussy, how dare we? We don't criticize Mozart. We love Chopin, well that's fine. So there is that spirit of generosity. I mean, there's a hell of a lot of bitchiness in music, for goodness sake, but at least musicians, they will criticize fellow musicians, but they will never say, Beethoven is greater than Mozart, Schubert is greater than Chopin. They will say, music comes first, then the composers. In literature, we say, literature comes first, then Shakespeare, Jane Austen. So, all musicians know music stands above any of its expositions. And I'm suggesting to you, hopefully not presumptuously, that all our problems will be solved if we put truth over the, 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 the inquiry of the truth, the discovery of truth, over and above any of the exponents of truth, be such exponents Buddha, Jesus, or Blavatsky, because they all said in their own way, the kingdom of heaven lies within. And those were their last words almost, be ye lamps unto yourselves. So truth stands over and above all its exposition. I hear people saying, and I've heard it recently, Krishnamurti was limited. Was he? Think of the arrogance.
arrogance. You'd never met him. You just read a little thing. I mean, senior people in the society. I would suggest that Krishnamurti is limited. If you read Krishnamurti alone, it is limiting. There's a difference between limiting and limited. The same with Blavatsky. Blavatsky was not limited. I would suggest that she knew the whole truth. But how can a teacher give up the whole truth other than what is relevant to the age, the mental climate, the problems, and the, the whole ambience of their time? But Blavatsky is limiting. If you only ring fence and put barbed wire around her and say nothing else, then everything else is rubbish. Krishnamurti was not limited. He is limiting. So are they all the other teachers. Do you see what I'm getting at? And how promiscuously we use words and throw out opinions. So really this whole question of teachers, if we realize that all teachers are like the vibrations from one silent chord of truth, and that silent chord throws out its resonances, and those resonances are all the great teachers, but all of those teachers have come from the soundless sound, the voice of the silence. There is one more thing that blocks our progress. In the very last letter received in 1900, by, uh, written to Ali Besant by Mahatma Cage, there is a clear warning about secrecy. And she, the, the letter says, sorry, the, uh, we'll go past this. Secrecy, I am saying, I am saying, is conveniently mistaken for confidentiality. And the Mahatma says, misleading secrecy has given the death blow to numerous organizations. <laughs> sorry about this. <laughs> Even in 1900, the Mahatma was warning. And the Mahatma letters are full of warnings about problems to come. Darwinism, Harold mentioned, perhaps even the Second World War. Their letters are like a, a template, like seed thoughts for what was going to happen. And this letter about excessive secrecy, I've not seen much state, uh, discussion on this topic. And I translate this message in just a simple term, transparency. If one speaks the truth, one has nothing to hide. One can be completely transparent. If one is cunning or wants to fulfill a hidden agenda or has acted irresponsibly, of course one wants to be secretive. So secrecy is conveniently uh, taken as a, a camouflage for confidentiality. Confidentiality, of course, is ethical, totally ethical. I'm not going to state the obvious here, but secrecy is not. And people become secretive when there is a, a guilty conscience to cover up, and then it's wrapped under a, a wrapping paper known as confidentiality, and the two are not the same. And the Mahatma has warned about it, and I suggest we take these warnings rather seriously, see how they apply in our lives, see how they apply in our society, and actually do something about it. We will continue after the tea break. Is that alright? Yes. Thank you. Thank you.